for uh, themes, right? Twelve point topics, themes, uh, pastoral themes. So, um, let's I'm going to end half of it. I'm sorry, yeah, but I'll do the rest of it. What does the term pastoral mean when it comes to uh, art and literature? What are we talking about when we're talking about pastoral themes? What is that? Just generic. Well, that's a crazy side, but specifically getting away from the city. Crazy side, away from the city. What is the derivation of the term? What is the term from the shepherds? Shepherds, exactly. Pastures, pastors, right? So the term pastor that we use in church is the shepherd of the flock, right? So pastorals have to do with a very specific kind of landscape. Not only is it removed from the rural or the urban landscape, but it is also a kind of landscape that's associated with a, a simpler way of life. Right? That's the key part, it's a simpler way of life. So it's not just specifically countryside. So it's countryside and unindustrialized. Okay. Although we're way ahead of the Industrial Revolution, but you can see I think. And you can certainly think, if you think about what we've learned about Venice as a physical place, um, the idea of you is something like this, right? Shepherds, farmers, the agrarian countryside. You can see that it all in, in so for, for being in the water, this is really not all sidewalks, you know. It's, it's more paved than most places will go. Now, there's a canal about these things, but there's no other place you want to sit in the park, right? Uh, take off your shoes and get the grass between your toes, you know? But it, it, you really can't do that in general, anywhere. And the canals are not good for swimming, right? Captain Tesla developed one of them uh, in the 1950s, it was only movie. And for Everett Ash, and that's what her boy started to do this because she got really, really sick. I'm not saying she didn't, but the canals have been sort of nation sewers since then, so, so, right? So, uh, the, these pastoral landscapes, these rural uh, landscapes, those the shepherds have an amazing feat, right, for them. So, the term means uh, shepherd. And one of the things we're going to tell us is that this, this theme goes back, 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 right, to ancient Rome. So the Roman poet Virgil, right, uh, wrote two different kinds of poems set in the countryside. One where it's all about relaxation, the other one where it's a bit more about work. But for us, the ones more about relaxation are the more important ones because while it's built around shepherds, they're never really having it all that time. Right? And that's what we've seen. We think about the Bellini that we looked at in class, right? Where we saw people who lived in the back of their ground when you see hard ads, right? Whether it was St. Francis or that Madonna from London, or the two guys were chatting out of the trees. Okay, you're now from Rosanna. Maybe there's this case that's an exchange, right? You talked about the importance of in, in pastoral poetry of the exchange, right? Maybe you say he's a lamb, but it doesn't have to just be a lamb. It's the idea of community and exchanging of gifts. And maybe my reading of that being under the tree is being sort of skanky, you know, and, and sexual. And she's holding wrong, right? There may be something more in it than that. And maybe be related back to this idea of pastoral poetry. Now, if we look at Venetian history, these Roman archetypes, right, these Roman poems that really introduced the, uh, the theme back in the first century um, are being revived in the hands of a number of Venetian poets who were famous in the time of and such texts. Right, so there are contemporaries of Giorgio Ney and Titian Bellini who are writing new poems, new pastoral poems, in the spirit and in the form of ancient Roman poetry. So while we often turn back to Virgil's eclogue, that's what the word famous means, uh, from Roman times, we can just as easily turn to contemporary. Right? Now, I want this is something though, this is false. By the way, when you guys get more and more, you never get. Um, 
picture. I thought it was close to you. And you can incorporate into that space. And that's been separated from the background behind it and the distance behind it. At the same time, that middle ground between really begins to establish a sort of feeling that you're part of. Right? That's what you've been believing. So we believe that the dominant are in our space, or really very close to where we are. And behind the ledge, you then get the space between us and uh, the city that sometimes on a on a on a hill, but often separated from us by a series of trees or groves or edges, fences, trees. And in that space, in that plane that extends from the foreground figure to the background are these other little elements that then add to the or to the sense of pastoral. Right? Okay. What kind of effect, we want to sort of touch on this, the effect this has on human beings. It's very inviting. Right? Compelling, right? It's dreamy. Different world. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 it is, uh, you ever wake up to a dream and wish you could just go right back to where you left off and you never really can? Right? It's that, that same sense of sort of the, the gravity it, it has. It pulls at you and says, this is better. And for people living in cities, this idea of a place where work happens but it's not hard. Right? When time kind of stands still, it's very, very attractive. You know, there's a place in the city, for example. Yeah. Would you go there this week, you know? Or for spring break, it's that kind of thing. So I do know Brittany is exactly right, uh, like a place where it's pretty in the musical of uh, the 50s and we can listen to each other. And uh, they go to this place in Ireland where they're trying to stop. And, uh, or Shang La right? The uh, Lost Rising and the idea of Shang La is a place where you never age. It's perfect, right? So the term in ancient literature, this is Arcadia, right? Uh, was the land where time makes you still. And that was, uh, you know, you never age, problems disappear, right? So there's an amazing sort of enticement to uh, proactively engage with the picture, to have a sort of empathetic relationship, to imagine yourself being part of it. And as you start to look at these kind of cases, we can start to see things that are meant to encourage us to do that. Uh, so there's some derivative points that's going back to some kind of past as well. And you can see things back to that and some of the things you saw even with them are sort of this idea of working our way back into work. It's not necessarily fully pastoral yet, but that's what we call this in it. How do you get people to engage with your picture? Engage with the now, uh, Roseanne talks about a number of sorts of subcategories of pastoral, right? Pastoral spaders, right? When it says satiric pastoral, pastoral spaders, religious pastoral, prose pastoral, right? Numerous sort of subcategories. But he doesn't really talk about them all. He really only talks about religious pastoral tradition, right? And then the sort of aftermath of drug But I kind of want to focus on the tradition. Because the big thing is how Titian, by changing certain elements of the landscape, how Titian is able to manipulate the meaning, even if a lot of things stay very, very much the same, just by manipulating a view of the pastoral bit, the pastoral folklore. Right? By manipulating a few of those, Titian can. Uh, Really alter the meaning. Right. So, uh, I've got these two up. I'm going to put them in the light and we'll sort of look at this. So, how does tradition change meaning uh, in a pastoral landscape? So, in both of these, right, he includes the enunciation to the background in the background. Right? So, in the background, right, of each picture, uh, these are both in London, by the way. Uh, right? Uh, we have an angel appearing in the background, telling the shepherds that the Savior has been born. Right? Uh, and they have very similar uh, layouts with the 
again, the grove uh, or a cave that separates us from the distance. In these, we don't actually see the city, but we do get the sense of deep removed from anything, right? Especially in the Aldo Brasini in the Donna on your left, where you can see uh, the light shining on the hill. Isn't that fantastic? Landscape element, right? Of how the light comes down and strikes the, the, the Alps there. But the, the two that are, are the biggest part of his discussion, it's nice to see them in color, um, are these two variations on exactly the same composition, which is something Titian did all the time, right? Throughout his entire career, he would rework compositions to see what he could get out of them, right? To see by what changing a few details here or there would do. Right? Yeah. That is in Fort Worth, yes. It's at the Kimball. Kim, the Kimball Museum, right? Uh, which is why it's, uh, this is a pretty good scan, but it's uh, not the best. Um, right? So we've got the Madonna in pretty much the same posture, even though uh, a few years separate them. There is some uh, discussion over the attribution of the one on the right. I guess we look at the face of the Madonna, for example. It's a little bit more hard edged than Titian's normal sort of cloudiness, atmospheric qualities. Um, what does Roseanne talk about when he compares these two pictures? What does he talk about? How does Titian manipulate the elements of the pastoral landscape in these? What does he change? And how does that affect the meaning? Who hasn't talked recently? Which is, well, yeah, Crystal, thank you. Okay, very good. So the color choices and the tone, right, the hue and the value range uh, have a huge impact on the meaning. So talk to me more, Chris, but what does he say about it? What was the change and what is the, what has he changed and, and how does it affect our reaction to it? Like he used um, glasses, or not glasses, but like lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli, yeah, on the left. Remembering like a joyous like burst of pride, it represents more of like the bad or the negative. Mm-hmm. And what's the blue on the right? It's much more mundane, right? Is it azurite? Not azurite blue. Is it azurite blue on the right? Right. So the color choices that he's using, natural materials themselves, can come with loaded with potential meaning. So lapis lazuli, real aquamarine, my right? true aquamarine. It's very, very expensive and also very, very luminous as a blue. Um, that makes it appropriate for the picture on the left because the angel is there, right? And therefore, the sky there is meant to be more than just sky. It's meant to be heaven. So he uses a very expensive pigment uh, in order to uh, symbolize heaven, right? On the right, uh, the angel is missing. And by omitting the angel and using a different blue, a darker blue, and including, uh, well, both of them have storms, don't they? But they're much more oppressive and dark and uh, moody on the right. Yeah. And he says that, you know, this changes the way we interpret it. One is about the joy of the incarnation. The other one is about the uh, sort of the predicting of, of, of Christ's sacrifice, right, at the end of time. Yeah, Margaret. Exactly, and that certainly ties into the meaning, right? And including John and the lamb uh, looking in from the side uh, definitely adds to that, that overall theme. Then we can talk about other choices he's making, such as this book. I mean, John is here as well. We just moved to the other side. He does have a well, he almost always has a cross as a kid, right? That's how we identify it. But, yeah, the offering is different. It's a flower and fruit uh, back in there still are elements here about sort of the harbinger of why Christ is born, but they're not nearly as uh, dramatic, right, as the one in the rock. And like I could add to that the fact that uh, the dominant color of the person's robe is red now, uh, which is the color of, 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 of suffering, right? So uh, that certainly ties into it as well. Okay? So he's omitted the angel, and by omitting the angel, Rosen argues that by omitting the angel, 
uh, he's turned the sky from heaven into normalcy, right? Now, I'm not 100% sure I, that's where I agree with him here. Because I think that if we look enough at Venetian pictures, we can find other places where lapis lazuli, true aquamarine, is used in the sky without an angel to make it sacred. And we've seen this already. Think about Bellini St. Francis, right? There's no angel there, right? Uh, yet, it's a moment of ecstasy, it's a moment of heaven revealing itself, but it's revealing itself through nature itself. So I don't know if the inclusion of the angel is entirely necessary to drive the point home. I think he's right in saying that they, they are teachers making changes to heighten certain moods, and maybe he chose to leave the angel up because he's trying to emphasize this idea of sacrifice and coming drama uh, in, in, the, in the Houston picture on the right. Fort Worth. Oh, no, wait, where's Kimball? Is it Fort Worth or is it? It's now the MFA in Houston. It's been moved. It's now they use maybe they bought it, but it's in it's in Texas. One of, it's in it's in it's in Houston. So anyway, the um I think I could be wrong. Uh, the the bigger point about the color tone and the choice of colors and their relationship to things that are being exploited is, is absolutely spot on. But I, for my money, he, he hinged a bit too much of it on the angel. You know, that the angel is what makes heaven sacred. When in fact, I think the, uh, it, it sort of under, undercuts the idea that the, it's how he uses the pastoral elements together. Right? Because the angel is not really part of the pastoral elements. But it's the other stuff that makes it so much more heavenly. Right? Now these ideas about Landscapes, the figures, its engagement with you, the viewer, its relationship to Venice, which are sort of brought up by all of this. We can apply it in dozens of pictures that we've seen, right? I can think of six or seven like this. That would make a really nice essay question on the exam, right? Uh, based on this reading, talking about pastoral landscape, right? And how it, uh, it affects the meaning in, in these two pictures. So you should be thinking about those kinds of, as you're reviewing from the exam um, on Friday, you should be thinking about those kinds of questions, right? Uh, what, how does this reading affect my understanding of the paintings from the list, right? Because these have been a sort of core part of the text stuff that we've been dealing with in these kinds of classes. Um, I wanted to bring these back in, and we'll be looking at the Giorgione in a little bit more detail here today. But in, in both of these, right, there is this question of, of whether or not Roseanne's idea that you need the angel to make landscapes sacred. Uh, both of these call that to question, right? As I mentioned, the angel on the right, which I have a detail of, is a later addition. The question that I cannot find the answer to is whether that later edition was from Giorgione's own hand or somebody else or how early it was, right? Um, but we'll be looking at some details here because as I was looking at this, um, I don't really notice the going to pictures of in a row. Um, I became really fascinated. First, I became fascinated by this comparison. Like, if you look at the – blur your eyes and look at the structure of the composition. And remember that Giorgione studied under Bellini. Right? This is, this is really, block it out, right? Take a pen and block out the composition on a, on a piece of paper. It's the same composition, right? Almost the exact same spot, uh, the cliff stop. Cave on the right, safe in light, right? Coming out of the cave and into the light. A distant background leading to hills. Light towards upper left corner. I mean, it's just, uh, there's so much that's parallel that it's hard not to think that Giorgione was recalling this, subconsciously or consciously, um, when he makes our picture in the National Gallery. Even the way the water runs down the lower left corner. You know, I mean, just, again, this can't just be chance. Um, here's a nice detail of the angel in the upper left corner. 
And you can see he has a banner in his hand with words on it that I can't quite make out um, swooping in. And uh, through X-ray, we know that uh, George Ernie fully painted the trees, didn't reserve a space for the angel, right? So the angels painted on top of other layers of paint. And that uh, helps us to understand that this is, in fact, a later addition. If I can tell you to make out a little bit here, um, how the brown paint on this arm goes down into the crack. Right. So, uh, it doesn't seem to be original to the composition, but apparently Roseanne didn't know that, you know, 25 years ago when he wrote this essay, uh, because he talks about it as being an integral part of the composition. And one wonders, because there's, there's some fascinating things about it that make me wonder whether or not you know, it was originally thought through and then to be added later, right? Um, I was kind of adamant when we were at the National Gallery that don't look at the angel. Right? Angel of the later edition. But I, I'm beginning to think about that angel in a, in a sort of more interesting way. I want to go back and look at something really quickly. Okay. Um, I was wondering about whether or not the angel was a source of light, heavenly light itself. Because you notice how the trees around the angel are illuminated from where the angel is. But so are the leaves. You know? So that doesn't get us anywhere. That's why I wanted to go back and wanted to look at it again. Right? You yeah, the leaves in that tree that bends towards St. Francis are also illuminated from our side, not from the clouds that are behind it, but from this side. So supernaturally lit, um, as are Georgiones. So it doesn't have to be the angel that is the source of light in this. Right? The pose of the angel is really, really similar to that Titian we had up um, at the beginning of class. Um, and Titian studied under Georgiones. In fact, this was... This has been attributed to Bellini, it's been attributed to our picture house, it's been attributed to Titian, it's been attributed to Giorgione, now everybody agrees, Giorgione. But the figures look very much like Bellini's figures, and there's an element that look a little bit like early Titian, who starts painting on his own around 1509, 1510, right around the time Giorgione dies. He's a very young man. So the fact that the angel resembles Titian's angels could be that he added it in. He could be the one who did. Right? Um, there are two versions of this, which is, makes it really interesting as well. And the other version in Vienna, you can tell from looking at the virgin's robe, it's actually unfinished. So that means Giorgione was still working on it when he died. And in fact, there's a record of somebody visiting his studio and seeing what they call the night piece. They don't say any more about it other than calling it a night piece. That was in his shop unfinished. Right? I don't know. Uh, young age. That's a joke. I don't, I, I have no idea. But if we look at the second version, right? Um, you, not only is it, <laughs> excuse me, unfinished, but on, on one hand it's very, very close. Right? Look at the wrist in the standing shepherd's robe. Right? In exactly the same place. Uh, the poses are all spot the same. Christ has the exact same pose. Joseph is making that little heart with his hands, you know. Um, and that's not what he's doing, but it's what he looks like, right? Um, uh, all the themes, uh, the, the angels up above, the little bubble-headed angels are there. Although, again, all of it kind of unfinished. At the same time, there are some other things that are, are missing altogether. Um, behind the standing shepherd, there is only one other shepherd there by the tree, rather than two in ours. There is no shepherd in the in the hut on the left, versus ours. The trees in the background are nowhere near so developed, and obviously there's no angel. Right? Much more obviously, because we can see straight through the trees. It certainly seems darker, as if it's uh, gloomier almost again. Um, and the fall of light on the buildings is not anywhere near so strong. It's not finished, so this lack of crispness would have come in the final layers of paint, right? Like, what, remember when we looked at uh, Pensadello de Messina? We, we talked about the fact that some of the crispness to the figure was missing because the last layers were graded off. I like the fact that he's still all over that orange robe that Joseph is wearing, right? Uh, that uh, sort of Extraordinary S-shaped swirl um, that goes up over his uh, over his shoulder. Right? 
Um, another thing about this that I think is kind of interesting is that we've done, there have been x-rays on this as well. And in the x-rays, uh, originally there was uh, the, the cliff under the overhang came all the way to the edge of that overhang, right? So we pushed the cliff back in, in hours, right? Uh, lower left corner, there's the big stump and the little stump. The little stump came up and became a bush. So you have less view of the landscape there as well, right? These are changes that George already made as he's working from the surface of the panel to the final top. And each of them is a decision to open up more landscapes. So with our uh, reading for today, which was about the importance of landscape in setting mood, in establishing meaning in these pictures, George is very much aware of that, and, and he's uh, really doing what he can to amplify the landscape, right, to use it uh, to good purpose. And so in our class today, I wanted to look at the landscape more. You also notice, um, well, I'll have a detail coming up, but the, the buildings on the far side of the water aren't there either, right? And I think that these are all very important parts of the meaning. They tie into the idea of the pastoral, as we see when we look at details, but they also, I think, tie into theological meanings as well. And again, uh, just so you don't take my word for it, there's only one shepherd down there leaning on the rock, right, looking toward the sky. The one who gestures isn't there, right, yet in this one. Now, maybe you can add it, but you can also see that the buildings in the background are still either under construction or in ruin, right? They're incomplete buildings. And he makes a point of giving us that scaffolding in the back. But they're all in exactly the same position, more or less, but not as, uh, like everything else, as Amanda noted, not as not as kind of finished. No, again, it's because, it's because he hasn't put the final layers of paint on, right? Again, as near as I can tell, nothing in, nothing in the hut. Um, I'm not going to try this little white six painter, but they don't look like a person. So, it could be, it could be, um, but I don't think it would make all that black paint first, right? Uh, so anyway, um, there we are. You're right, it could be, but even then I think it's in a different position than the one that we have in our picture. So, uh, comparing that now, what we realize is that not only has George only opened up the landscape, um, added details to that landscape that add to the meaning but that this meaning is one that focuses primarily on the shepherds. Right? This picture, while it's, uh, you know, Christ is the holy figure, and the Virgin Mary and Joseph are there, um, really the, the, the focal point are those two shepherds. Right? And what Torjone has done is he's taken a rather risky move um, by pushing Christ and the Virgin Mary off to the right border. This is, this is really uh, uh, extraordinary. Even in Venetian painting, to have them off to the side like that, to have them not this, this sort of uh, symmetrical center of the composition, right? And who is the center of the composition? It's just those two shepherds who have come to worship. So uh, while there are other pictures of the adorations of the shepherds, they're usually coming in from the side, right? Here he places them dead in the center. And I think that he's using the pastoral landscape to emphasize the role of the shepherds, the importance of them for this composition. So he opens up more landscape as he works, cuts a tree down, right, scales back, cliffs, all of this to allow more of the landscape detail, the pastoral landscape, to, to enhance the importance of the, the two shepherds. Um, I had noticed that our last trip to the National Guard, directly behind him, uh, the fellow that was added and not in the other composition that's gesturing actually had a sheep next to him. I'd never seen those, probably because I visually they just sort of blended into the row. Uh, but he seems a very sketchy done, sketchily done. Uh, but that's again to emphasize that we are shepherds. And you'll notice that they're not working, right? Again, that was something that Roseanne talks about is, uh, that in Arcadia, in uh, in pastoral poetry, work uh, is a theme of sorts, but it's never actually being done. 
So our shepherds are taking a break while their sheep graze peacefully uh, here on the edge of the, on the edge of this river. Um, the both of them direct our attention toward the angel, particularly the, the shepherd who's leaning on the rock, right? And you'll notice he's also leaning on a walking stick. So he is working his way. And again, this metaphor for travel that we talked about downtown, uh, he's going to be a traveling shepherd. He's going to be fo- following the angel's direction. He's going to be making his way toward uh, the manger in the same way that the two in the foreground already have. Their eyes are toward the angel, particularly the fellow in red, um, whereas the gesturing figure isn't really pointing at the angel, is he? It seems to me he's pointing at that guy. And now maybe that is. Maybe, Jay, I think you're right. Now. That's where he is. That's where the two white streaks are here. So maybe he's going to block in the head and the shoulders, right? It seems as if he's pointing at his, in his fellow shepherd sitting over here um, by the shed. I looked as hard as I could to see what that little glimmer was inside the shed. Um, I can't make anything out there, right? Uh, let's go back down with binoculars or something uh, to try to see. But you can see he's very, very slightly painted. Um, and I think that's, you know, the shepherds are there to call attention to each other, right? Rather than to the miracle itself, even though the one is looking um, up in, in that direction. Uh, as we look at the landscape in the background, it begins also to further emphasize uh, this. I think I, I actually had the same slide twice. Yeah, I do. Uh, so, um, one of the things I wanted to point to here is that that's not a lake, but rather that's a river, a very wide river, because lakes don't have rapids, right? lakes don't have a current, right? And you can see where the building comes off of those rocks, there's some man-made elements that protrude into the water, and the water cascades over them. So this is very much a river, not a lake. And there are other details that indicate that to us very clearly. Um, if you look at the far shore, the building is a mill. You see the water wheel on the outside of the mill? Obviously, water wheels don't work in a lake, right? You have to have flowing water. So what we're seeing here is where a river sort of comes off from the left, sweeps around, and then cuts back left again. We're on sort of a, uh, a oxbow bend of the river, right? Even though it reads initially as a uh, as a lake, this is certainly not the case, right? Now I was interested in this mill because you know mills are where you grind flour. Flour is used for bread. Christ is the bread of life, right? Uh, we're seeing the moment when the body of Christ has literally been prepared, presented to the people. But the mill in the background, which might seem a rather mundane element, part of the pastoral landscape, is incorporated here to, to add to the meaning. Right? Um, the other structure has also been identified as a mill or a granary. Uh, extending out to the water, uh, but again, it's much more badly damaged. Not the painting, but the building, right? You can see the structures down below are broken off, right? And this is, again, where the uh, uh, water begins to cascade over. Um, I believe that these are two absolutely tiny figures uh, right here uh, on the rocks. Can you see those two little ticks there, right? Ghostly ticks. And the more we look at the landscape, it seems that there are places where there probably are intended to be people everywhere populating, especially right in front of that. Uh, right on the shores of the river, we have uh, two figures. And it, again, it looks like an exchange, right? The hands are coming out toward each other. Uh, very similar to what Bellini included in the background um, of his pictures as well. Right? Is that a you know, discussion? That's not yeah. No, I think that's part of this thing here. I think one of the ears is coming out. It's like an old dog, right? So this is initially attached to all of that, right? Uh, it looks like a boat, but it's not. It's attached to the place. So you see here that all that structure. In the same way that this is also a building structure here, I believe, as well. Right. It looks like a boat is docking out to the... It's 
does. I, I think that if you wanted that to be the case, and that's, there's good metaphors one could bring into that, right? Safe harbor, which is, uh, you know, the idea of travel, which is what Chuck has done. Um, I think it would have made it a little bit more clear, right? Um, I think this is, this seems to fit with me because the tone of the case is exactly the same tone as the rest of the building. I think you think it's part of this man-made structure uh, of the sort that was managed suggest is, is, is uh, sort of broken, right? Do you think those two figures, you know, in the mirror before, like, they were actually in the mirror? It could be, yeah. Like, uh, it's hard to say for sure. I think that, you know, I saw these with my naked eye. That's why I took the picture. So I think that they are relatively clear because they're silhouetted against the background, right? Keep in mind that this set up, this is going Wi-Fi to that, right? So it's not um, as clear as it might be. It's a good projector and all, right? Um, but I think it's including these, again, to give us a sense of, of this overall mood of the landscape, which is one of repose, right? Not one of work, of working class, but not at work. Um, the buildings are intended, obviously, to be uh, in need of repair, it seems. But you'll notice that we have all sorts of different kinds of buildings. It almost looks like a monastery back there, right? And we have uh, civic buildings, uh, like the tower in the foreground, uh, what appears to be like a palazzo on top of the hill in the background. But in front of it, uh, what looks like the name of a church as well, right? Uh, so, a lot to it. And then... I think what's really quite lovely is the fall of light across all of these different buildings, that sense of of evening light. And I think that's another, you know, there's multiple sub-themes here. The shepherds are certainly part of it, a huge part of it. But I think another theme here is light. Um, natural light versus divine light. Natural light as divine light. Um, and so in the background, this, this light's coming from behind those trees, right? The trees on the upper left. So it's coming across the water because the sun is getting low on the horizon. It's illuminating that tower, the side of the rock, the building behind it, this whole theory. Right. And catching these, you know, low enough that the other buildings are casting shadows on the top. Even though in the sky, it looks like the sun is over higher. But all of that's coming behind this tree. Right? It's not going to be our side. And uh Georgia is very careful with this, I think. This is not really by chance the way he's working with this. Again, this is some nice detail. Uh that we can see that the sort of the way in which the fall of light is is, is so important to him uh in these buildings that appear in the in the background, right? Sorry? Yeah, yeah that's great. And, it's, and the more you look, the more there is. This really is a marvelous picture. Um, and that idea of light is, I think, the reason for the torch that we saw when we were downtown, right? As we looked inside that building uh, directly behind the bush, there's a very prominent torch light. Nobody's there attending to it. It's just inside a small cave or part of that building, a small opening in the building. And this is indeed a, a sign of the sort of the natural light, uh, as opposed to this heavenly light that surrounds us everywhere else. Right? This natural, you know, uh, sky light versus man-made light, right? Uh, so I think that, again, emphasizes that sub theme about the fall of light. And if we look, this is what struck me as I was putting this slideshow together, is the degree to which there is this, I'll do it through my screen pen, right? Um, there's a fall of light coming literally on them. There's a pool of light at the foreground. that you can see it's hitting Christ. It's hitting the side of the cave. It's hitting the backs of the shepherds. It's hitting the face of the Virgin Mary and the side of Joseph's head, right? That that light is incredibly directional. And you miss it at first because of all the atmosphere. But as you look at it more, you start to realize that the light that's hitting that tree, right, behind the angel, is actually flooding down specifically on them. And that's something one hand talks about. That there's a very, you know, in one of the tissues, there's this directional fall of light that sanctifies the Virgin Mary. Right? Well, here it is again. 
and it may well be independent of the angel, right? Even though the angel is here, and we don't know really what that was doing. The more you look at the picture of the Mars, the more you realize it's almost like a stage set. There's one beam of light that comes down and turns, starts to fade about the feet of the shepherds. Starts to fade just about the heads of the shepherds, right? And it's not really coming from Christ, because the front ends of the shepherds are both shadowed, right? It's coming from the upper left corner. And even though the shepherds don't just cast really stark shadows, they cast the sun. Right? <clears throat> so the natural light of the world, or maybe not, maybe this is the supernatural light that supersedes the natural, right? The natural light of the world is falling on those buildings in the background. The light that falls in the foreground is supernatural light. The light that illuminates the scene for you, the viewer, so you can see it. That's the light of God. Right? So there are multiple light sources in here, and as we look at them, we begin to think that there's meaning as well. Right? This runs parallel to the theme of the shepherds, right? having arrived now uh, at the birth of Christ. And following the example of the Holy Family in front of them, right? they are uh, praying in the same way that the Virgin does. Um, I took details, I don't think I brought them in. Um, the Virgin's locked fingers, the their thumbs are, are locked. Right, like a golfer locks their fingers in putting, you know, one over the other. And the shepherd, nearly the shepherd has it, right? Joseph does it. <laughs> oh, what do I do with my fingers? And it's like, uh, 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 right over left, left over right. As I said, they do look like oh, we're using software, that's right. Uh, but yeah, so Joseph is, is not quite there yet, right? The, the shepherds have figured it out first. Even though I think uh, this George Jordan does very, very sympathetic Joseph, right? Um, and so there's a close-up of the two of them. Uh, so we can see that pooling of light, that incredible light that catches um, that orange of Joseph's robe, that fantastic orange that really radiates the light. And even in the unfinished version in Vienna that we saw before, this part was still finished, right? Joseph's uh, spectacular orange robe, which really does... Uh, help to tie in the other end of that, that beam of light. Right. So, overkill, right? We've talked about the tree. So, right, it's hitting that side of the tree. It seems to be coming from right where the angel is, which could be used as an argument that uh, George only meant to put it there, but, you know, somebody else put it in later, or even George only did. Uh, at the same time, it's exactly what we saw with Bellini in St. Francis, where you don't need the angel to have a heavenly ray of light. Right. So, even though uh, the nativity is ostensibly about Christ, what we find with this picture is that there's so much more going on. That it's not just simply them worshiping Christ. It really is about uh, how landscape can be used, uh, these pastoral themes, traditions in landscape can be used to... Um, alter and build meaning, right? Add to it in, in, in numerous uh, different ways. Um, if the angel is original, right, then you'll notice that Jesus in the adoration of the shepherds doesn't react to it at all, right? If we go back, uh, we can see that he's, he's kind of dead asleep, you know? Um, Humans can be, but, you know, if he thinks there's anything, it's wrong. Um, and not to the heavenly break of light that's streaming across the canvas. And uh, one of the things Roseanne mentions is that uh, between the petitions, when he gets rid of the angel, Christ stops pointing at him. Right? If we go back to those first two pictures that we saw. Um, here, let's just, let's just go back to those first two pictures that we saw. He's kind of pointing over his shoulder. So we're, we're on slide 23. So we'll just go back here. Right. Take a look. Right? He's really looking up at that angel. Right? And the gesture is, is really toward the direction of the angel. And when the angel disappears, then he's more self-contained. Right? And, and Rosen makes a big thing about this. Right? The angel sanctifies and Christ recognizes it. Okay. 
Um, let's go back into where we were. Uh, hang on a second. And show, go back to 23. I'm not quite sure what gets recorded when I do this. Because it's recording the slideshow. Um, in this case, go back to 23. Uh, if that angel is original, he's not at all paying it any kind of recognition, right? And our other picture has no angel. There's no place for it. It's never been included. And yet, he's pointing over her shoulder. He's pointing toward that light. So I don't think it's as hard and fast as... I mean, Rosen brings a great idea. Look at the gestures of Christ. Look at what's in the sky. Look at what he's reacting to or not. That's very, very important because it impacts the meaning, right? So with the adoration of the shepherds, the fact that he's not reacting makes us focus on the shepherds more. Makes us focus on the landscape more. Less on Christ. It's not about him so much. It's about worshiping him rather than understanding something about his character. Here, he begins now to point out the window. So he's, he's indicating that the fall of light that we see here is something that maybe we should be paying attention to. What's happening outside the window is something we should be paying attention to. Right? And there, I, I didn't have to go back. It's right there. Right? So, uh, this is similar to the, the London picture where he's reacting to the angel, but he's not reacting um, to anything. Right? There's nothing going on out there. Uh, again, just like our uh, other pictures of the National Gallery, we see natural light hitting a, 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 a tower in disrepair. But we seem to see what's another source of light hitting the front end of that tree. Now, it's a much smaller detail not as fully painted the tree is, but you still get the sense of a sort of a heavenly source of light and, a, and an earthly source of light. But since the theme here is not the adoration of the shepherds, the shepherds don't have anything to do with this, um, the light source is a little bit more muted. It's much more naturalistic. It's as if Christ is pointing through the window, just, hey, look at that landscape. You know, look what, look what George Oney has included here. Um, so there's the, the source of the light that's illuminating the building. Again, coming from the upper left, the same corner, the same sort of, I believe these are both lapis lazuli as well, pure ultramarine, uh, falling down on the landscape. The fall of light is something that George only actually pays attention to. I only just notice this, but the shadow on the sill, right? The light has come through that window and has illuminated this grotto where they are, right, this, this ruined building where we can see exposed brickwork. Right? So he's very much concerned with the fall of light as a part of the theme, but you'll notice that it doesn't have the same effect. I might have a detail, but there are two figures on that path. You can just barely see them, right, of walking there. But again, that's just such a part of these landscapes, right? Um, and anyway, this is what Christ is, is pointing at. Let's see, here's my next picture of baby Christ sort of pointing over her shoulder and saying, you know, something's out the window. Um, I mentioned that at the National Gallery that I, I really think that the, the theme of this is the flight into Egypt, where Joseph leads the Holy Family out of trouble because Herod is going to kill all the kids because the Magi accidentally told him, right? So according to legend, it is the three wives, right? After they've come and seen Christ. Um, they're on their way out. No, they're on their way there, and they, and they ask Herod, you know, um, we've been following the star, and everybody's looking for him. He goes, well, king has been born here. It's king. Right? I'm king. <laughs> um, and how long have you been traveling? I go, two years. Well, then I better kill all the two-year-old boys, right? Uh, so that someone will not usurp my power. Uh, an angel warns Joseph, and he leads the Virgin Mary in Christ on a donkey back out of Israel, right, into Egypt for sanctuary, while the bloodshed happens, and then they go back. Now, a common theme is the rest of the slide is if I have a slide of that coming up, that I think this is the same theme. But that would account for why Christ is pointing to the landscape. Again, pastoral landscape used for a different thematic emphasis. Not among shepherds in their importance as the first witnesses to the birth of Christ. That's what 
they are, right? They beat the Magi there. They are the first people. Who does Christ first appear to? Right? The poor. The working class. I like that. You know? The rich people, they got to wait. Get in line. Take a number. Like everybody else. Right? The landscape in our nativity picture, our adoration of the shepherds, emphasizes all of that idea. Right? The importance of the shepherds. The nobility of these working class women. This picture uses the landscape to emphasize this other theme, which is the theme of travel. Because in the landscape, not only do we have the buildings that we've seen before, right, rustic, unbuilt, broken, but we also have a very prominent path with figures on it as well. Now, there were paths in the back of the Adoration of the Shepherds picture, but they weren't. It is striking as things that are intended to lead your eye on a little visual pilgrimage, you know, a little visual uh, trek through the countryside. But they just were sort of a natural part of the countryside. So here, Christ is pointing um, at that landscape, at that path. What the heck? Oh, I actually hit my uh, iPod, I, iPhone or iPad thing. Sorry about that. Uh, Christ is pointing out the window, and, then that, and what we see is this path coming down the hill. And you'll notice that as we read the landscape much more closely, uh, not only do we see figures walking on the path, but you can tell from this slide um, that the part of the terrain where we are, where the Virgin Mary is, uh, Christ Joseph, is a bit up from there, right? It's kind of come up the hill to where they are. But over and above that, this area with the path, and them, and the building in the background, is well above the landscape beyond. Right? It's, it's down low. It's in a valley. So we're on the sort of ridge top here. Right? Moving along that path to where they are. Now, a high road in art, or in literature for that matter, what does it mean to take the high road? Moral high ground, right? A more difficult path. You're not taking the easy route. Right? And is not the walk of faith the more difficult walk? You know, that's the metaphor I think that we're seeing here, that they are working their way through a very difficult path, you know, through the shorthand of, of the landscape. And Christ is saying, this is where we came from. So, again, a nice detail of the, of just those wisps of figures. There's another two there in the shadow. You can see the reverse silhouette, right? So two dark against the light, two more light against the dark as we work our way back uh, into the sort of the shadow. And again, the way that the path disappears into the corner there, the shadow suggests, I think, also the, the, the difficulty of this of this trek uh, that the Holy Family is making, the importance of travel. Is there another figure in the far left? The far left. Right here? Yeah. Possibly, yeah, that little stick with the dot on the top. Right? Uh, this is why you know when you get into the spyglass, you know, the United like, you know, smooch you in the spyglass, right? It's this big, and you can look through it. It's just just looking, looking towards it. But yeah, that looks like one with high figures on the wall. So these paintings are exactly the same ones we've done. Yeah. From this raking angle, not so much, but when I come to the front of the house, too. Yeah. 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 Yeah.